Hey folks, welcome back to the Dice Tower Preview. I'm Mark. And I'm Randy. Today we're taking a look at Hellenica. Hellenica is brought to you by Mr. B Games. It plays from one to seven players, ages 11 and up, and each game takes two to three hours to play. Great, well come along with us as we build, expand, and wage war, all in an effort to become known throughout history as the ideal representation of Greek culture. All right, so this is what a typical setup is gonna look like. You're gonna take the main board and put it in the middle of the table. You're gonna put markers on the turn track and on the chaos track. And then you'll set up the rival deities. Now, you'll also set up the pathos cards. These cards are your public objectives that everyone can work on. Now, you'll also put all the tokens within reach to all players, as well as the cards. After you've set up the common elements of the game, you will give each player a player board, a set of cubes in their color, as well as a cube in a neutral color, a set of three cards representing gods, of which each player will choose one to be their initial patron deity, a set of three favor tokens. Additionally, each player will get a, uh, three starting buildings for their starting location, and these will be the same for each player. There will be a marketplace, an academy, and a temple dedicated to the patron god that they've chosen. They will also get two unit chits, one being a hoplite fighter unit, and the other one being a uh, trireme ship unit. Lastly, they will get a chit representing their government type. Now, all players initially start with a form of government that is tyranny, but they have options to, to change that later on in the game. Lastly, you will choose who will be the first player, and you will give that person the favorite of the gods marker. And in this case, we know it's Mark, so we'll give it to him. Of course it is. Now, each turn of Hellenica is divided up into four phases. The first phase is the ethos phase. This is where you're gonna be picking your private objectives. Mm -hmm. So each player will receive five cards and you'll pick two. Now, if you choose not to delve into a particular objective yet, you can pay a cost to wait until next turn mm -hmm. and maybe see how the board evolves before you jump into deciding what your private objectives will be. But some of the examples of these would be things like you have more favor than any other player at the end of the game. That's one of the, the private objectives. Another one is research all trade enhancements, and you'll do that on your tech tree on your player card. So there's a lot of different types of objectives that you can um, go through in this game. So you really can change the variability of the game and how you play each time. Right, now these are your private objectives and they complement the public objectives. Exactly. So the, the ethos cards complement what we call the pathos or pathos cards. Mm -hmm. And remember that the goal of the game is the first player at the end of a turn to have completed three of these exactly. objectives. So any combination of public and private actually wins the game. And the next we have the favorite of the gods phase. And that simply is who have, whoever has the most favor tokens will be the first player. The third phase of a turn is the action phase, and this is really where the meat of the game lies. It is indeed. Beginning with a player who has the favorite of the god's token in front of them, and proceeding either clockwise or counterclockwise, depending upon which side of the token is face up, each player will perform one of seven actions, and then pass control to the next player in sequence. Now, most of these actions involve taking a cube from your player board mm. and putting it someplace on the map to activate a location. We'll now talk about each of these seven actions very briefly to give you an idea of what you can do in the game. Let's start with the research and advancement action. Now this is an action that involves you expanding your tech tree to make your civilization more powerful, more right. efficient, and so forth. You'll see on your player mat this tech tree which consists of level one and level two advancements in each of five different areas. The way you research an advancement is to take a cube from the research area of your player mat, and if you don't have any cubes there, you can't perform this action, right. and choosing a location or city area to activate. Mm -hmm. Now, in that city area, you must have a, an active academy in order to perform this action. And again, right. if you don't have an active acad academy, you cannot perform this action. All buildings start out as active, and by that I mean they don't have a cube on top of them indicating that they have been exhausted. When you start the game, your home area does have a single academy mm -hmm. there. And if you choose that location, you will get one of these philosopher tokens for each active academy you have in that location. So if you only have one there, you'd get one. Right. If you have two active academies, you get two and so forth. After getting these philosopher tokens, you then put the cube that you've taken from your player board in the top of the academy to indicate that particular academy has been exhausted. Right. Now these 
philosopher tokens are the currency that you spend. Super powerful. Yeah, they you are, really need these. You definitely need them if you're going to expand your civilization. Yeah. So you spend these to do the level to basically build your level one and level two advancements. Level one advancements cost one philosopher. Mm -hmm. Level two advance, uh, advancements cost three philosophers. Right. Now, let's say you were lucky enough to have uh, a location or city area with three academies in it, and you chose to activate that location, you would get three philosopher tokens as long as mm -hmm. they were all active to begin with. Um, you then have the option of either buying a level one or level two. You only can buy, build a level two mm -hmm. if you have the same number of a level one um, yeah. advancements built. So if you, if you build a level one advancement, you then have the option of building a level two advancement. But before you can build the second level two advancement, you have to build a second level one advancement in that location. If you have these three philosopher tokens and you choose just to build a level one advancement, the remaining two philosophers, yeah, just bank them. You can bank them for future turns, which right. is really nice. Now, what do these advancements do? Why do you want to build them? Mm -hmm. uh, they do a variety of things. Uh, many of them allow you to unlock yes. a, additional spaces additional for, more, for more cubes. Yeah. So that means uh, in the future, if you wanted to do two research actions, you would. You would do that by first unlocking that second location. Right. Other things these advancements do is increase your military power. Mm -hmm. They allow you to build in adjacent locations, not just in city areas that you own, and even to build wonders of the world. The next action we're going to talk about is worship. And this one is particularly important to me right now because I have an objective card that says to have the most favor of the gods. So... It might be telegraphing my objective, but I'm going to be building a lot of temples and I'm going to be activating them as much as possible. And what again, what you do is you move from your action panel, you move the cube to the temple and you will gain then favor of the God tokens based on however many temples are in this area. Next action we're going to talk about is build. And again, build is important. Well, build's important for everybody. But again, for me, I'm going to be building a lot of temples, right? right? So... The thing is, though, that when you build, you have these generic cubes that aren't related to your color mm -hmm. at all. And you're going to place the building out and then place the cube in the building, showing that it is under construction, right. okay? And this is real key because if you activate, like, temples again, you activate them and one is under construction, you don't get to collect favor of the gods right. with that one out there. You have to wait till next turn when that building is fully constructed. Now, some of the different building possibilities, you have things like barracks and docks, stables, city walls, markets, temples, academies, and wonders of the world. There's lots of different options here. We're not going to dive into all what they do, but just know they help you expand and grow your civilization. The next type of action is the train action. For this, you will take a cube from the train area of your board and place it in one of four building types depending upon the type of military unit you want to produce. Yes. If you place the train cube in a barracks, you will produce a hoplite. And this is the foot soldier mm -hmm. of the Greek Empire. If you place it in a stable area, you will produce uh, cavalry, which yep. are the horsemen. If you place it in a docks building, you will produce triremes. Now, these are military units that are ships, ships. but they also allow your other military units to travel mm -hmm. over, the, over the waters. And lastly, if you place this in an academy, uh, you yes. will produce heroes. Now, it's very key here. Military that, might. Yes. So placing a cube in the academy is different depending upon what type of cube you put there. Yep. Again, we mentioned before, if you use the research uh, a cube from the research area, you, you research an advancement, but mm -hmm. in this case we're taking a cube from the train area and training using the academy to produce a hero. Either way, you exhaust the academy. Now you've created military units, and it's great to have them hang around your, your yes, cities for defense, defensive purposes, yeah. but if you want to be on the offensive and move, move them out of the locations where they've been creative, you need to supply them. They cannot move without supplies. Right. You do this by taking a, uh, a cube from the supply area of your player board, mm -hmm. if you have one there, and you put it in a space with a market. Now, regardless of how many markets you have in a location, a city location that you're activating, you will only get one commerce token. Right. So let's do that in our home city here. And we put this here to exhaust it. And what we get in exchange is a commerce token. Will you pass me one of those? Yes, please? indeed. Now, the commerce tokens can be used, as soon as you've gotten them, to designate one particular location that you're going to supply for mm -hmm. movement. Uh, and you can have any number of troops there. Each of those troops can be, are then supplied to move to an adjacent location. Right. Now, 
Um, some of these can move, can be supplied multiple times, mm -hmm. and each troop type has a, a different number of times they can they can be supplied during this particular turn. But in any case, you let's say I put this down here. All the troops in that location don't have to move to the same location, but no. those that are moving to the same location do have to move as a group. This is how um, you you move them across yeah. the board and, and expand. And it's very important that you do make certain you have enough supply cubes, and you can have up to ten here to activate a variety of markets so that you can uh, keep your troops moving throughout the game. Now once you've supplied and moved, the gods take notice, you're gonna flip over a world event card. And based on where you are on the track, the track just might move down and the card gets discarded. Now, if you hit the bottom of the track, then that card becomes available for all players to bid on. And the way you bid is you're gonna use favor from the gods as you're bidding as what you're gonna to use to try to win that card. So it's a blind bid, Everyone yeah. pulls tokens into your hand, pulls them in the middle of the table, reveals, and whoever has the most will win that card. Now, why is that awesome to win these cards, right? Because they do some amazing things. So like Good Omen is gonna allow you to collect favor as if you just worshiped in all your cities. So you could potentially get a ton of more favor especially, of the gods. Especially if you'd built a lot of temples. If you yeah. had a lot of temples. So there's some really interesting things happen. There's also just silence, nothing happens right. in the world. So that doesn't move the track at all. And of course, another example would be choose and receive for free one allowable military advancement. So there are definitely reasons to bid on these cards, but then you also are giving up favor. Right, so that might be a hard it's decision a real for you because your, your personal objective, your yes. private objective is to get the most favor, but you might find one of these cards that are worth bidding a lot on. And, right. and then, yeah. yeah. Now, if there's a tie, whoever is currently the favorite gets to decide who wins that tie. So there's benefits of having this. Yes. The next type of action you can perform is converting three commerce that you might have left over from a previous turn or previous action mm -hmm. into a bonus action. And what a bonus action is, is it's just a regular type of action you see here, but you don't have to spin a cube from your player board to perform it, and you don't have to exhaust one of the buildings. Right. So this has uh, a variety of benefits there. And you might choose to perform your bonus action before you perform your regular actions, because then you don't have a bunch of exhausted buildings Indeed. there. Yeah. Um, the last type of action you can take is to pass. Now you have to pass if you don't have any more actions you can take, but you might choose to pass because for, for a variety of reasons. You might say, I wanna save commerce for later. You might say, well, I wanna see what all the other players are going to do before I take any more actions. Mm -hmm. But there's a benefit to passing early. Yes. When you do pass, you move all your cubes off your board to your stockpile. And for each cube you get, you move off of there, you get one commerce up to a maximum of two. two. So there's some benefits in passing early, not two. doing some actions, because it does give you some more money to spend later on. strategic withdrawal. Absolutely. Now, in the course of moving, you may end up moving your units into an area where there are enemy units and then combat will begin. And there's a set of dice and these dice represent the different types of units. Blue are for the hoplites, mm -hmm. green are for the cavalry, and yellow represents your hero. So what happens is, depending on if you have a regular type of unit or a, an elite type of unit, mm -hmm. will determine what dice and how many dice you roll. Mm -hmm. So for like an elite hoplite, you're gonna be rolling two dice. For a standard hoplite, you roll a single dice. And then for cavalry, it's a green dice. And again, for an elite cavalry, it's two green dice. But if you happen to have both, you get an extra blue, right? That's true. Which is pretty slick. So the thing is that you're getting a lot of dice here, but ultimately when you roll these, you're gonna take the highest value, right. and that's going to be your combat value. But you do have this hero dice. And the hero dice is going to augment your combat levels. If you're lucky enough to if roll one of those values, enough, that's right. Because there is a bad side to the hero dice. There is a skull, and if you roll the skull, it does unfortunately kill your hero. Right, a critical combat failure. Combat is dangerous, after all, right? <laughs> it's a critical failure, indeed. So let's say I entered into a location with three regular hoplites and one elite cavalry mm -hmm. unit. Uh, I would get one blue mm -hmm. for all three of those. Not for right. each, but right. the total, I'd get one blue die representing all three of those regular hoplite units. I'd also get two greens mm -hmm. representing the elite cavalry, even though I've just got one of those guys. Right. And because I had both types of units, I you would get, get, the extra blue. I'd get one bonus blue die. That's right. And then combat resolves by whoever rolled the highest combat value. And wh whoever the winner is, they get to choose which unit on the opposing side 
to remove from the map and put back into the pool. Now, it's important to know that heroes themselves can't be removed, so that's one reason that you might engage correct. them in, in the combat itself. In land battles, only hoplites and cavalry and heroes are engaged. If right. you have any triremes involved, you don't include them. Right. Now, you can also battle on sea, but kind of the reverse is mm -hmm. there. Hoplites and cavalry don't get don't, involved. Yep. Only triremes and heroes are involved in sea battles. Now, another thing about combat is if you have chosen to build a city wall and an attacking force moves into your area, you can actually stay behind that wall and get some benefits. That's right. And that's why you build these things, right? So if you stay behind the wall, you're going to get a, an extra blue dice and you're going to add one to your combat power. Now, when somebody enters into a location where a city wall exists, uh, combat's actually optional. Yes. The defending player has the first option of initiating combat, and if they do, the assumption is they move outside the city walls and combat's mm -hmm. performed on the field, so they don't get the benefits you mentioned. Right. But if they stay behind their walls and the invading forces chooses to initiate uh, combat, right. then the defender gets the bonuses the bonus. you mentioned. And really, that's why you build those things. Exactly. Yeah. Now, if neither side initiates combat, then the city is considered to be mm. under siege. Yes. And the detriment of that is you cannot uh, build any buildings or upgrades in the city, right. and no cubes can be retrieved from the city at the end of the turn. Well, it's, it's a really good thematic choice, actually, it because is. you are too busy with what's going on in the out in the field. Right. Battle, right, and, and, there, well, and, and there are people are blocking supply They're lines blocking and supplies things like line. that. It's pretty cool. Additionally, uh, during the upkeep phase, we'll talk about that in a second, mm -hmm. um, the defense Defending player must remove one upgrade or building from their city or mm -hmm. remove a unit from their city. So things start, you know, there's attrition going there on, is. people are starving potentially. So when you're under siege, you want to do something about it and you might not be able to stay behind those walls as long as you'd like. Indeed. And then finally, we move to the upkeep phase. And this is really pretty straightforward. Everyone's going to go out to the board and gather up their cubes and put them in their stockpile. Now, of course, the exception here is if your city is under siege, then those cubes are going to stay in place. That's right. And as we said before, for each city you own that's under siege, you must remove either one building or one unit from that city. Additionally, if you have any cities that are occupied only by opposing forces and by none of your own, mm. that city is considered conquered. And so ownership transfers to the opposing player, and half the buildings in that city are destroyed at random. Indeed, the spoils of war. That's right. And then finally, you're going to check for victory condition, which is if any player has completed three objective cards. Now, if no one has done this, then you move on, and all the players will take their cubes and repopulate their player boards, and you move the player or the next turn marker up one spot. That's right. Hey folks, just a reminder once again, this has been a Dice Tower paid preview, and everything you've seen here has been in prototype form. So keep a close eye on the campaign for any changes that still may occur. Now that said, you know, this is a huge sweeping game that has a ton of different options, a lot going on, and really far too many for us to cover completely in this video. But, you know, turns move really, really fast, regardless of how many players are in the game. And one of the nice things too, is that if there's only a couple players or even a solo game, mm -hmm. there is an AI character you can introduce. And you can even introduce multiple AI mm -hmm. characters. And I find that pretty intriguing because it really, changes up how things play oh, out. Definitely. They have the AI player has multiple strategies. Yes. So yeah. Additionally something we didn't mention that's very thematic is that you can invoke your patron god mm. to, or patron deity to do some things throughout the right. game. It all depends upon how many temples to them you've acquired and how much favor you have to spend. So mm -hmm. for example, if I've got Hera here and I built three temples to her right. and I've got three favor to spend, I can cast trickery and mm. ignore city walls during combat. Super trickery. So there's a lot of variety that comes from the patron gods as well. Yeah, indeed. So ultimately, folks, if this is like a game that would be of interest to you, I'm sure they would appreciate your support. That's right. I think that's it from us. Yep. And until next time, we'll see you at the table. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews, as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching the Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool Stuff, in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.